us to be sort of uh, to be open to whoever is saying what. I mean, even if there are people who haven't adjudicated uh, parliamentary debates before, it would be very interesting to hear. In fact, can sometimes give a very very good feedback to listen. Uh, I mean, to listen the sort of feedback from non non trained adjudicators, right? Because they are coming from this this sort of empty space of space of just convincing, where they were not probably looking at this debate from the lens of rules and how a parliamentary debate is sort of go, but they have this only single consideration if who was able to convince them more, right? And that sort of feedback can be can be very sort of uh, important in learning how you can sort of break down your arguments better, uh, decomplicate your arguments, right? Which is something very important. We can sort of throw a lot of arguments, throw a lot of words, but the idea to sort of de complicate arguments, contextualize them within which that a coherent case is made, right? Um, that's something that, that you learn the best when the feedback comes from someone who's probably, who is not sort of bounded by uh, the rules of parliamentary debate. So here what, um, what we can do is that for the next 10 to 12 minutes, considering I think I have 25 minutes right now, so what we can do is that we can spend the rest, next 10-15 minutes listening to uh, your understanding of the debate and then uh, in the last 10 minutes I can sort of conclude this and, and tell you what, what sort of I took from the debate. If that's, if that's a, I mean, if that's a framework that works fine with everyone. Oh, Rahul, we just wanted to check something. Yeah. Can you see any raised hands? Uh, I can see right now, yes. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, uh, students, so you can raise your hands and share your thoughts on the debate with Mr. Rahul. Okay, I see someone. Aditya, if you could, Aditya Prasad, if you could unmute yourself and uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, no, sir, I was one of the speakers. Um, I, not, a, not an outlook on what the debate was, but more of a more of a question um, uh, in your in your you know in your uh, in in your debating um, you know experience you will obviously come across uh, very um, critical topics you know ones that need to be tread with uh, very carefully so uh, what how would you approach something like that when you know that the opponent can easily misunderstand or even the judge for that matter can easily misunderstand and throw you off could you give me an example? I mean, I, I, I sort of no, get what you're saying, but if you give me an example, like like, like today's topic, which was discussed, mm -hmm. uh, I I sort of went out on a limb and started saying that the government wasn't, you know, doing a great job and, and stuff like that towards the ending. Uh, and obviously that sort of makes me sound like uh, someone who, you know, someone sort of a con in, in some sort of condescending way or like not uh, being a little arrogant on my points. So it, uh, in those kind of situations where the topics are extremely critical and the points are strong on both ends, how would you thread it? No, I mean, it's fairly simple, right? I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I feel like, I mean, saying things like, oh, government's point do not make sense is not condescending at all. I mean, in a parliamentary debate, I've heard much meaner things being said and meaner words being exchanged. So I think you're fine there. Uh, uh, I think, as you yourself said, the idea is um, to make a stronger case for yourself. And I, I think there are possibility of stronger arguments sort of everywhere and, and if there are um, if there are if, if you see in a debate where the sort of both the teams touch on strong arguments for their respective sides, I think what then it ends up boiling down to in a lot of close debates is which team has contextualized uh, the motion better, right? And 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 what sort of coherence that they've got, right? So it can it does not have to do anything to do with the quantity of arguments. It does not require that. I mean, if there are four possible arguments in this, you have to take all four. The idea, again, as I said, the bottom line is to convince your adjudicator that you make more sense. And and you, you convince them through the motion or whatever the burden on you is. Burden is sort of a technical term. But the, but the broad idea is to sort of convince, right? And the idea is then... I mean, then it comes to your idea of coherence to, you know, sort of what's the structure that the three speakers have, have followed uh, to, I think, contextualization is very important in, 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 in debates with two very strong teams, with, with teams which have got really strong arguments by their side. 
in a very evenly sort of balanced uh, motions. I think it boils down to contextualization, and I'll, I'll come to contextualization uh, in the framework of this debate when I when I go to I mean when I do my later bit, and I'll sort of try to sort of just tell you what I mean by contextualization because it's a sort of a loaded word. But I'll tell you what, what, when I say the word. I mean, you have to contextualize the motion and contextualize your argument. What I mean by that, um, and it's it's fairly simple. So if if there are more people who can sort of say something about the debate, and again, like I mean, it's not just like I mean, you don't have to necessarily tell me who won, who lost. But what's what sort of your takeaway from the debate was? How you felt? What if there was one argument that you found convincing? Why did you find it convincing? Basically, just your understanding of debate. Uh, it'd be great to hear something. I just want to check if there is any uh, technical issue. Can uh, an attendee I, please? So I can see one gun, uh, one hand go up right now. Shivanika, uh, if I've got your name right, uh, you can you can yes, speak sir, right yes, now. So uh, just I uh, just wanted to give my view. There was one question about uh, feminism being in the corporate, but they are not practicing it. Like uh, they show off or kind of things like that, but they don't practice. That kind of a question is there. That looked more like this to me. If that was practiced, then feminism in the advertisements are accepted. First you practice and then you do. That doesn't matter. That way that sounded, which was actually going for the opposition party. Hmm. And about okay. one more thing that they was uh, mm-hmm. specifying about one person. I don't remember about who. their board members don't have a woman but is the question is about whether that corporate doesn't give equal opportunities for both male and female i mean the interview or the competition is just the same for everyone i mean i'm just talking about the present day not about history mm-hmm. and all those things in present day we mm-hmm. get equal opportunities and that is what we strive for we shouldn't now uh, think about uh, women being given with extra privileges we are talking about equal privileges in that sort of a thing everyone were given and after that the end result maybe male were more intelligent or that sort of a time maybe a woman who participated didn't like succeed being a woman i do accept that point we only the feminism the point is we get equal opportunity not we get over privilege over men that's all these two points were something that came to my mind thank you so much sir and your speeches were amazing thank you so much for this Okay, that was I. I hope like that. That was for the speaker. So I mean, well done, guys. Clearly, your friends are like, like your debates as well. I, I have Farhan and followed by Bolinda. Um, so Farhan, if you can go next, followed by Bolinda. Yes, sir. So uh, what I feel here is I'm not in the element to actually judge the debate, but what I feel about it is uh, is that uh, there were a lot of opening statements. I feel and and there were few words which the speakers could have you know explained like feminism. This person like this is feminism, but they re- didn't really tell what feminism is according to them. That they are, you know, they're sticking out of feminism. But you know, it was better if you actually, you know, explain a little more about feminism there. Plus, I really found that the debate was on and the uh, opposition was not speaker. That's where I actually felt that a person was debating. That he actually went back on the points and you know actually you know you know actually acknowledged the other points. But otherwise, I just felt it was more of opening statements. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pooran. Bolinda, uh, if you can go next. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. Where um, uh, what I gathered from the debate, um, I think the speaker spoke well, uh, given the time limit. But uh, and I agree with Farhan. Uh, we we all talk about feminism, but uh, most of us, most people don't know what it is actually about. Uh, in fact, feminism is a very uh, misunderstood topic. Uh, women themselves find find it embarrassing to admit that they are they are feminist. So uh, I think, uh, from the debate point of view, I think uh, the opposition spoke well because they justified uh, the corporate stance. Uh, because uh, if you think from a business per- perspective, any any business they will use anything and everything to uh, sell their products. 
and feminism is just another concept and if you speak about the government perspective perspective i think even governments use that and i'm not pointing out any government here but i think uh, any political party they use women to show that they stand for women when in reality the opposite happens this like for instance we see uh, parties holding celebrities up saying uh, it's this uh, women's rights like how donald trump uh, picked up amy coney barrett and he said he is the most uh, he's one of the politicians who respects women the most but we know that's not true so um so it's it's just at today concept suggest used for uh, each party or uh, corporate benefit and uh, it's all up to us it's up to the consumers it's, it's up to women to choose and to the people to choose who or what is right uh, institutions and systems will remain thank you thank you thank you uh, we have one more hand uh, himandi and if there's someone one more person after that we can take that and then uh, we will move to the okay so himali and diksha uh, you guys can go uh, respectively Him, uh, himali followed by diksha uh, himali uh, okay uh, i just had one up observation to me think uh, the opposition was for the first two speakers was a little off track as focus on corporate feminism in itself but focus on gender feminism as mm-hmm. a um and one more one more observation is that that the part, that the party which is not so adhering the gender rules the um in all and to Himali, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know if it's an issue that everyone's facing, or is just me, uh, because your voice is slightly breaking for me. Uh, no, we can't hear her too. Yeah. Okay. Um, positive time. Uh, can we move to Diksha? I'm so sorry, Himali. Um, if that's all right. Yeah. Diksha. Okay. Um. um thank you sir also great job for all these speakers but again like uh, as amari was stating initially there was a lack of interaction i felt because there was no engagement in debate i think one of the others also pointed out that it sounded like opening statement because of the fact that um, the 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 first two members of the opposition didn't really focus much on waiting about corporate feminism they focused too much on the idea of feminism itself which was not really the i didn't think that was the focus area uh, maybe if they could have if the first speaker could have defined that they would be taking this sort of a route that could have created a little more engagement but i felt there was a little bit of lack of engagement that okay that's that's great diksha um i see no more hands up so i will just uh move on to the next bit i think i think uh, first of all i think whoever spoke right now i think they 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 made some really interesting observations about the debate which i cannot necessarily say is not true i mean i i think uh, uh, most of you picked up some really interesting aspects about uh, about the debate and and sort of that shows that um your uh, intuitive observation of the debate was was pretty much okay um the only thing is i think some of you also who spoke about uh, i I'm, i'm forgetting who it was who was speaking about political party uh, one of the one of the essential rules about the duty keeping is that um, and which is also quite an interesting process is to keep our biases aside right so uh, for example if in 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 a debate topic the teams don't necessarily if they don't bring up political parties we as a judicators are not supposed to to sort of impose that notion uh for any side for that matter like you know sort of make that argument for a team which the team themselves haven't made for them now it's a, it's it's much easier said than done because we all have a lot of our inherent biases um and those biases a lot of the times we know about them we can acknowledge them but a lot of the times those biases are unacknowledged we i mean we don't even know that we are biased about certain something and we sort of subconsciously end up making a lot of those connections and start making an argument easier start making another argument slightly difficult 
Um, so, and it's a work in progress. It's not something that you adjudicate once and you'll be able to dispassionately, uh, you know, sort of disconnect yourself from a debate and, and adjudicate. I mean, even Supreme Court judges are not able to do that, right? So, I mean, we are just, we are mortal humans. We should not take it too uh, seriously upon ourselves. But the idea is, I mean, it theoretically requires you to sort of be dispassionate and, and, and look at the debate from debater's perspective and not from your own biases and, and making constructing arguments from them. That's a broad rule that exists uh, within parliamentary debate, right? Um, but now coming to the debate, right? I mean, as I think um, the last two people spoke about, uh, and one of the feedback that they had about the debate is that the, the first few speeches, there was there was very, uh, I mean, so the teams made their parallel, own parallel argument. Um, and... Uh, the engagement could have been a little better. Now, what do they mean by engagement is essentially is that once the prime minister and the leader of opposition had spoken, the teams could respond to each other a little more and 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 uh, engage with their arguments. Now, uh, essentially, what you'll you'll hear a lot of uh, uh, people say about parliamentary debate is that uh, that you're supposed to refute and make your own argument. Whereas, what I feel essentially is that these entire processes are a little more intertwined where I don't think refuting is separate from making new argument. Uh, essentially, a lot of the times when you're making your own argument, they are, in most of the arguments would be refuting the proposition's argument in some way or the other. And the idea is to put that into perspective while you're making your arguments to make sure that as an adjudicator, you're letting me know that these are the arguments that you're sort of, uh, you know, you're responding to from proposition and that sort of shows that there is a lot more direct engagement and if the other speaker does not come back and defend it just makes you have an edge over the other uh, sort of team. Now let me give an example from the debate right now a topic on which both sides made sort of parallel arguments but the engagement could have been a bit more better right so I think one of the themes that emerged out of the debate was about corporate culture right uh, I mean, one bit was about advertisement, and we'll come to that a little later, but about corporate culture and, and what does it mean for a company to be truly feminist, uh, for a corporate feminism to look like. And I think uh, one sub-argument within that which the government was making was that, look, there are these corporates which does not have uh, equal women representation, be it in, uh, be it in, in, in their board structure to their employees. I think the first speaker's arguments on that were also again very interesting with respect to entire sweatshop argument that she made about how uh, I mean a lot of these girl power shirts are made in Bangladesh in really bad working situations right and 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 that sort of disconnect between what is the intent of the corporation I mean do they really care about women empowerment when on one hand they are getting their t-shirts called girl power being made but you have these workers who are making it and and I think the second again the second speaker spoke about this entire class which is again very interesting but these are arguments that the government could have just made coherent and made links with it when they're speaking about class when they're speaking about intersectionality again a fascinating uh, argument to 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 bring in this argument really strong like that that sort of uh, that hit that argument that you know someone was speaking about intersectionality here in 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 this brilliant and and I think there were arguments around intersectionality in all three speeches of governments, but they were just thrown around here and there. Uh, and one coherent sort of line delineating what you were speaking about intersectionality. What did you mean about uh, corporate position and and representation and and sort of a more coherent picture could have made for a much more stronger. Now on the opposition, I think. The engagement on this became slightly about giving examples about those two, three companies, right? I mean, like HP and like, look, they have they have these uh, corporate policies about equal representation. But A, that does not essentially convince me that there isn't a corporate culture. Again, something that the government could have tackled it much better. But just the fact that they're refuting to that entire argument about corporate culture of sexism or like, you know, not being feminist enough, by giving two exceptional examples shows that corporates by and large are not feminist or whatever. I mean, something on those lines which you were sort of making arguments and leaving those pieces thrown around in your speeches here and there and rather than 
uh, giving me a sort of consolidated comprehensive account of what it is right so that's just one example another argument was about for example advertisement and i think the last speaker in opposition was interesting in terms of just making drawing together what an advertisement is supposed to do um and i think again uh, and i'll take this sort of theme to talk about when i was talking about contextualizing right so in a motion like this you there are three four words which jump out at you right uh, you have feminism right and and i think a lot of people were saying that i mean it would have helped if there was some context given about feminism that's where i felt like the opposition's first speaker sort of uh, could have a uh, use their time more appropriately uh, if that's that's a good way to put it um that i think especially after pm had spoken uh, i don't think there was a disagreement in the in the debate that there is a need for feminism right i think the need for feminism was fairly agreed on both sides by the by this by the by, by both teams in this debate right the disagreement was more so about whether the entire corporatization of feminism is that desirable within that right so uh, does it harm feminism does it portray an unrealistic idea of feminism uh, is it is it uh, is it a just a money making facade which is a sort of characterization that the first speaker was trying to give but there are multiple formulations of feminism that that can exist right and i think a direct engagement uh, by the two sides on on i mean a do you have two different meanings of feminism within this debate if you have two different meanings then a more direct engagement as to why their conception of feminism is different i think one of the speakers again in the in the second speech from opposition the speaker just slid in this line which was i think again something which was responding to proposition but like nothing came out of it which was about wage gap one of the substantive arguments about proposition was about what are corporates doing about wage gap and and within this i mean entire i mean because their construction of advertisement on the side proposition was that it's it's something which is tokenism it's something that they do it for a couple of months uh, there is entire the class argument that they were coming up with uh, especially with beauty products etc etc right um, but i think there was a lot of scope for proposition to take that argument that i think i i think that was a very meaty argument that could have been elevated to a much much better scale right i mean and for that what you had to do is tell me what i mean what does a feminist ad look like in the current scenario but also tell me what it could look like right what are the limitation between uh, with, i mean i mean in the, the current like sort of scenario where so i mean a, a sort of an example of the top of my head which if i was on your side i would sort of use is that while you have those girl party shirts and again the kind of products where you know you will you will see like let's say fairness cream have been fairly interesting within the debate but for example you have dove and ole which are trying to do these advertisements about uh you know whatever are uh, sort of deconstructing what body image is and you know sort of trying to normalize different body types uh, but what you seeing that there is an inherent sort of class angle to those sort of advertisements because your your detergents your move look at the characterization of women in those sort of ads abhi bhi move ke ad mein the auntie is going to do all the work raat mein move laga ke she'll again work tomorrow but you are constructing a particular idea of women through that ad in a in a washing powder ad Uh, which are again ads which are sort of more democratic ad a washing powder is used obviously in much more homes than a ole cream right in that ad it's the woman washing clothes um so h- how is corporate sort of what is an overall portrayal of gender within the uh, ad uh, sphere and and something to and and that could have made a much more coherent case i i feel like for opposition to be construct but then there i think where opposition and this is i mean a should have could have territory right when opposition is trying to sort of say that look there are feminism has this larger socio political economic construction they are defending i mean you are not sort of we are not i mean essentially what you would have the case which you sort of made but to sort of make it stronger uh, could have been that yes there are i mean there is no problem with acknowledging limitation within uh, corporatization or or within uh within capitalism there are certain limitations yes there are problems with the wage a uh, period gap which is a stance that i would have taken i would necessarily not refute the wage it is a structural problem it is a problem that there are no there are only men at the top but what you are trying to say 
is that for ad as a space, what you could have done to me to convince me is that you could have portrayed a that ad plays an important role into social, socio-cultural consciousness. It's an important form of entertainment that we consume, and what we see, and and the idea of right and wrong, which are said there, do make a difference. So, what you could have said is that what proposition is trying to say that it's not making enough of a difference, and and that takes time. But the idea that that Nike today feels the need to to, to you know to promote female athletes is something which wasn't happening 15 years back right so you know so from the from the kind of case that proposition is constructing what they're saying that unless and until you bring more women to the boardroom unless and until you um, you you know equalize wage gap unless and until you shut off sweatshops in Bangladesh which are much much larger structural issues which can take a lot more time to sort of fix them right and a lot of them cannot be sweatshops is not necessarily uh, just the economic problem of Nike. It is also a political, social, social problem of Bangladesh, right? So there are there are there are realms of power that corporates don't control, and they are trying to do what they can control in that sphere, and they're trying to respond to um, and they exist in society. So they're, they're responding to certain demands of society, and and trying to construct that. So idea is what I'm trying to get back is that once you get a motion, try to break them down. Try to Put them in certain contexts, which makes it easier for uh, for a listener to sort of understand the themes that you're going to talk about. Um, and and spending that bit of time, especially in the first two speeches, can make jobs for your second and third speakers um, really easy. And I'm seeing that I'm running out of time, so I will I will hold myself right now. And if there are questions, and I I, I don't know the appropriateness of how long we can go. I'm okay going for another five ten minutes if everyone's fine, and we can do. Few more it's, questions, and we can extend another ten minutes. That's not okay. Much. So I will, I will probably stop here. And uh, if there are questions, if there are things that people want to clarify, maybe then I can work on those specific bits rather than just going uh, in my, I mean, in my own. Uh, we can follow the same format. If anyone has any comments or questions, uh, they can put their hands up and. Uh, Okay, I have a hand up. Go ahead, uh, Timaya. Um, so, sir, I have a question where in relating to... So, basically, you are debating about a topic you personally don't believe in. But mm -hmm. still, you got to maintain a stance which is against your belief. So, how do you um, maintain your composure or, like, how do you maintain your points at that point in time? Um, um, good question. Again, it's it's. I I don't think there is like a sort of how to. It's it is a matter of practice. But I mean something that really helps you, and that's what I was talking about uh, when I was talking about first principles uh, in a debate. That when you get emotions, don't think about it in terms of uh, in terms of side. Right. I mean, I think one of the things that I mean, me and my teammate used to do is that we used to spend the first five to seven minutes talking about the motion without taking a side on it, right? So, for example, I mean, if I if if I got this motion and we, we had 20 minutes, like, I mean, we would spend the first 5-10 minutes without preparing a proposition on our opposition argument, just breaking down what corporate appropriation of feminism means, right? Take the key words from motion, break them down. And what that does, once you break essential aspects of the motion, is that then it helps you, uh, I think, A, it makes the entire process of seeing the other side much easier. Um, and in more, like, I mean, so for example, I mean, I don't know what sort of stance you could take on this. I mean, again, uh, something that I said that the moment you're in law school, just consider any opinion or ideology that you've formed um, to be something which is unlearnable. Right. So always you have to always stay open to that and debating is a brilliant platform to sort of uh, get into that process of unlearning. But so, for example, I mean, the moment I break down what corporate appropriation is, what can corporate appropriation mean? So corporate appropriation, one form is advertisement. One form is, uh, I mean, their own internal corporate practices. For example, I take these two. And then once I have little elements, then I start thinking from my side is that what is an argument about advertisement I can put, which I can make in this, 
to prove that i mean that something can i be i can be proud of so then you then you starting to construct your your arguments in the way is that look this is what feminism means uh, i mean which in whatever terms you define feminism i mean if we like just uh, agree to the essential fundamental equality of opportunity framework uh, for uh, all genders right i mean then you see how how does advertisement do it right now and then you start sort of selectively thinking in terms of those okay this is how i'm going to i'm i'm going to framework the idea of advertisement because you have you have room in that you have room in sort of making your audience believe what an advertisement is what's the role of advertisement right so an advertisement does not have one single role i mean they defined advertisement as something which is a means to sell products to make um, corporates rich which is one acceptable framework for why advertisements happen but it does not stop from advertisements having more iconic roles to play there are advertisement hymns that we sing there are ads that we end up remembering and they do play an important like not just entertaining but they do end up playing a very important part in our social consciousness so you go towards that sort of uh, construction depending on emotion and and you make the adjudicator believe in your construction of the emotion and and sort of bring the arguments from there um, but it's a work in progress and it takes some time to to get there so absolutely fine uh, we have vijay sri and i'll, I'll move to her uh, just just one minute before that question Uh, students, the feedback form has been shared in the chat, right? And for YouTube, it has been put on the YouTube chat box there. So please uh, click on that. You yeah, can give your feedbacks. We can continue. Sir, uh, uh, so my question was, uh, one of the speakers was asked a question in between. Um, so my question is, how do you focus on answering the question and you know, um, blocking all your panic thoughts and keeping up, keep it, keep, keep keeping your calm? That's my question. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, this is again fairly simple, right? I mean, so um, uh, one of the things that once you have a very coherent so one one of the ways to look at your debate arguments that you're forming you prepare as a team right uh, you have to have a there are separate arguments in a debate but all those separate arguments are directing you towards a singular case that a picture that you're drawing so whenever you're prepping never sort of make your arguments in disjunction you should there is like all those arguments that you're making separately towards towards a larger case and once you start constructing preparing your motions in that fashion what ends up happening is that any question that comes up within that theme you'll be able to connect it to one of the arguments which you would have already made um so i i completely forgotten what the question what the poi in this one was but I, i what i remember is that it was from the theme of the debate right so you can you can always sort of um you always have the option of listening to the question and if you feel like your further argument response to that question you can always be like i i mean my speech further clarifies that argument and when you come to that part of your speech which is sort of which connects to the theme of the question you can just say that i mean i'm making this argument and it connects to the question that you are asking remember that as a speaker you have that momentary position of power and you control the narrative right so there is absolutely no need to panic you choose to respond to it in the way that you want to uh if it's something that you think you can readily respond to at that time respond to it at that time if you feel like don't want to you sort of it will derail you from the argument that you're making then you can continue making your argument and respond to that question within the theme that you're arguing but these are the two uh like sort of ways that i'm saying but the idea is essentially that you are in power at the time the 7 minute 20 seconds are yours um and so long as you're engaging with the question you're fine uh, there is necessarily not one way to sort of respond to the question so panicking is definitely like not required right i mean you are i mean there's you are in position of power in that time to sort of respond the question the person is going to ask the question and sit back they can't uh heckle you to answer that question so that's one weird thing right i mean so you can come back to that you can sort of keep the question at the back of your head continue making an argument and a, a counter comes up to you you can bring that up there are multiple ways to sort of uh get to that uh pooja 
Good afternoon, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for uh, this uh, wonderful session and very informative. Uh, my question is uh, with regard to the role of an adjudicator. Uh, I have observed that in both the teams, there were some arguments which were quite strong in the first from the government side and some arguments were quite strong uh, when the opposition team came. So uh, my question is, the role of educator is just to uh, decide upon which team wins or it is also to highlight the points of arguments which are strong in both the teams uh, to connect it or like that. Uh, I, very good question. In fact, yeah, I mean, so essentially your question sort of covers what the role of an adjudicator is and um, essentially they are supposed to decide who's the winner and, and sort of who hasn't won. Um, but a more important duty of the adjudicator is to, uh, is to define the terms of, I mean, in, in, in explain in terms of debate, I mean, in terms of the arguments that were thrown at them as to who won. So, I mean, rather than the verdict, what matters more is the justification that follows after the verdict. And again, you don't have to, I mean, you can sort of, in your feedback, tell the teams what arguments were stronger from one side and what arguments weren't stronger from the one side. But essentially what you have to, you don't have to get into a numerical exercise key there are three arguments which were strong from one side, two are strong arguments from the other side. I don't think that works in that way. The idea is that, I mean, one team can have just one strong argument. The other team could have made five independent, really strong arguments by themselves. But you could have found the other team's case to be more convincing because essentially they're debating a motion. And you have to essentially ask, I mean, if the motion in this is this house, so that's the corporate appropriation of feminism. Which side proved you? Did the proposition prove you? the regret of corporate feminism better than uh, opposition's case that it does not regret, right? And that's that's the most, that's the fundamental question on which every argument rests. Um, so they, they could be, there could have been five very good independent arguments made, but they did not engage with one central argument of, of, um, of the proposition. So I don't think it's a numerical exercise. It's, it's a much more holistic, um, um, deep exercise than that. Um, and you have to put all the argument in perspective of that motion uh, and how it sort of has built and connects to other arguments and how it has sort of uh, been contextualized for you to understand the debate, right? Because very independent, good arguments could have been said about uh, about them. And, and, and but for example, uh, the, uh, the corporate example that I was giving initially about corporate culture, right? What side opposition kept interestingly doing is it refute that argument just by example, right? Now, those two could be true examples, but for me, for example, vis-a-vis -vis that, proposition's argument still ended up standing because whatever they said about that was more convincing about corporate culture and that by and large being true uh, within the feminists. And, and what they were able to show through that argument is that there was a disconnect between... Um, uh, between what they're practicing inside and what they're portraying outside. Now, it's essentially some sort of hypocrisy. They could have acknowledged that hypocrisy and sort of tried to show me which they did not know, which they tried to refute by giving two examples of these um, companies who are not, let's say, exist. But then, I mean, again, the proposition could have, in fact, used this argument to sort of further their argument is that, look, they, they literally agreed with our argument that to the entire construction of uh, problematic sexual, uh, I mean, uh, uh, unfeministic or patriarchal practices of corporate culture, they have given two exceptions, which proves our argument more than theirs. Uh, so there are ways in which that engagement can develop, which uh, some debates will happen in different ways. But the idea is to sort of keep a lot of these considerations into mind and then approach. And and since I don't have much time, there are two, three things important that I wanted to just speak about. That some, it's something uh, like parliamentary debating, what is what is I think very exciting and something which which personally I learned a lot is that it gives you opportunity to learn a lot of broad topics, right? Um, you you have to have certain uh, idea about economics to to to, to sociology to law to uh, to psychology to gender um, and learn a lot of these aspects which will essentially we would never be able to learn. 
um, inside our classroom, right? Um, look at the news that we consume through certain critical lenses. Um, and uh, since parliamentary debate is something which essentially requires you to make logical arguments, here the idea isn't you can't say that Abraham Lincoln said that and it has a strong value which would have happened in a conventional debate where you come cite Ambedkar, Gandhi, Lincoln, someone, and, and that itself has weight. Here, the source of the information does not. So you could have read a very, you could have read Socrates or, or Aristotle. You have to convince the adjudicator through the weight of your logic, right? So what, what is required is that even these breadth of subjects that you read, you have to conceptualize in, in raw logical form um, and that makes the information very democratic for you to consume. Uh, it makes you, it makes it easy for you to to question what you're what you're reading, be more critical of the text that and the media that we're consuming, and everything. And that connects to the first question that one of the speakers asked, right? That what if I feel very strongly? The I, debating will eventually make you feel humble about the about the positions and opinions that you hold, and you'll be always open to being. Uh, to, to your opinion being changed if a stronger argument is given against it, right? Um, so all of us have to be, and that's not, just a, that's not just a trick that debaters have to learn. I think we all have to uh, sort of learn the idea that, I mean, uh, changing your opinion is necessary in all occasions, not hypocrisy. Um, if it's happening in light of good, convincing, strong arguments, uh, it's a good skill to possess. I do not think in the same way as I used to think five years back. Uh, definitely not the way I used to think when I had entered law school ten years back. Um, so it's it's, it's 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 an essential part of growing as as human thinking human beings. So that's okay. I mean, more learning, more reading, and being open to more ideas just is is a part of an important process which law school readily does for all of us. Um, that's what I have. I think, I mean, we can go on and like, I mean, it's, it's something that can never get over, but I think, uh, I think we should, we should call it a close at the moment. Yes. Uh, at night now I'd like to call uh, Surjit sir. Uh, to give the vote of thanks. Surjit sir, please. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Sorry that we're eating into your lunch time, but uh, it was uh, a very productive day. And uh, lots of uh, what Rahul said also reminded me of, uh, you know, my time in debating. And in the end, when uh, he mentioned how he wasn't uh, the same person as he was when he joined law school, and how uh, debate completely altered his uh, perception about how he thinks about things. That was something very relatable, right? So uh, exactly what Mr. Rahul mentions about how you can't uh, cite a random big personality and uh, hope to get your arguments accepted. That is exactly what I did in my first debate. It was a debate on religion. I went and cited Karl Marx, very wrongly in fact. And um, obviously the adjudicator asked me, so what? Right. So uh, uh, Rahul made sure that we mentioned how the debating is vital to developing your reasoning skills. And I really liked how he uh, put debating in a broader picture here, where it is not really restricted to just the competition, but rather, in fact, to your whole life. Right. So even if you are writing research papers and all of that, debating and the reasoning skills that you are going to put into the debating, right, especially the critical thinking part that he mentioned, uh, you learn to question things differently. You learn to see things uh, more than just unidimensionally, right? And uh, that is something that uh, Rahul emphasized a lot. And uh, finally, apart from all of this, we would also, of course, should uh, appreciate and thank Mr. Rahul for, you know, getting up at 6 a.m. We know how hard it is, especially when you are a student, of course. So we thank Rahul for that as well. And on behalf of the DEFCOM, once again, we extend our sincerest gratitude to Mr. Rahul. And yeah, so... And apart from that, uh, lots of interesting points from you guys as well. Uh, interesting arguments that uh, you made about uh, uh, the, the debate itself, right? So I see a lot of uh, people with lots of different, uh, very in-depth views. So please take part in debates, right? 
uh, circulate a message by the end of today. You will either have to uh, text the faculty coordinators or we'll provide a link itself through which we can form a WhatsApp group and we can start having our practice debates online. Okay, we could uh, do it in a very simple manner. And we also have much more plans to conduct more inter-college, intra-college debates as well as to start sending you guys outside. So far, we have not really entered the uh, uh, circuit. We have the debating circuit, parliamentary debating circuit. So this year, we hope to make a break, right? We uh, hope to push you guys outside. So please join us for that, right? And uh, yes, with that, we can close the session. Thank you for that. Please make sure you Okay, bye. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahul. Uh, I have also put up all the links on the chat box. You may all uh, you may all take it down. I'm just going to wait for uh, a little while before I end the meeting so that you can take down the feedback form and the YouTube links for your training uh, for in relation to parliamentary debating.